welcome to our second panel of the day, which will focus on racial bias and healthcare disparities. And although we've talked about it in the intro um, during our lunchtime talk, and on the first panel, we are going to focus particularly on how racial bias throughout the healthcare system, whether it's through the patient physician relationship, whether it's how the institution is structured, um, how care is actually given, and also how racism does affect your health. Okay, I am going to um, I'm going to introduce our speakers in the order that they will be speaking. We also have an additional speaker, Dr. Mary Frances Berry, who will come in. She's also speaking at another um, event today, so she will come in and uh, be introduced and then present, and then we will continue on with the speakers who are here. So let me start, and I apologize. Um, a lot has been made about me keeping people on time, so I am limiting somewhat the bios, but just know that everybody here is esteemed, will, <laughs> will polish, awarded many awards. <laughs> All right, I will start with uh, Dr. Fagan, who is Executive Medical Director for Cook County Health and Hospital System and Medical Director for the John H. Stroger Junior Hospital of Cook County. She was previously Associate Chief Medical Officer for uh, the Cook County Ambulatory and Community Health Network and Interim Chief Medical Officer of the Cook County Health and Hospital System. Um, she is a past president of Physicians for a National Health Program and has appeared on a number of national te television and radio programs on their behalf. And next, following her, will be Dr. Uh, Van Ryan. Um, Dr. Van Ryan is a professor of health services research at the Mayo Clinic School of Medicine and director of the research program on equity and quality in healthcare encounters, Division of Healthcare Policy and Research, Mayo Clinic. The overall goal of her research program is to eliminate racial and other inequalities in healthcare by advancing understanding of the mechanisms through which patient and provider social position, ascribed status and stigma affects healthcare encounters and outcomes, and developing and testing interventions to promote equity and quality of care. Next, Professor Bowser. Um, is associate professor at the University of St. Thomas School of Law. After receiving his JD, he practiced law with major law firms in, San, in the San Francisco area from 1994 through 1997, specializing in the field of health law. He has served as an advisor to the Department of Health and Human Services and is a member of the Board of Directors of the Center for Race and Bioethics. Um, his current research focuses on the impact of medical and bioethical policy on communities of color. He has presented papers relating to his research um, on racial bias and medical treatment at numerous forums, including the Tuskegee Center Conference on Bioethics, Minorities and the Law, the International Conference on Mental Health, and the 2001 Mid-Atlantic People of Color Conference at the Dick Dickinson School of Law. And last but not least is Dr. Uh, David, co-director of Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, Stroger Hospital, Cook County. He is an attending neonatalist uh, and co-director of the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit at Stroger Hospital, Cook County. His clinical work involves care for newborns from a low-income minority and immigrant po population in Chicago. His research has focused on perinatal epidemiology and more specifically on the relation between social inequality, especially racism in its various forms and birth outcomes. And for all the panels, I've enjoyed all of their work and cited, so I'm looking forward to the discussion um, to continue with this panel. Um, Dr. Fagan. So I decided to go without the PowerPoint. Um, so 
we've, I've really enjoyed the discussion this morning, but I have a question to ask. What is race? When people think about that, who am I? When I walk into a room, I know that people see a black woman. And yet, I am the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. I'm the daughter of a Jamaican immigrant who had US citizenship by virtue of his father working on the Panama Canal Zone. In this country, we focus on phenotypic as opposed to genotypic discussions and characteristics of who we are. My daughter, Angela Davis Fagan, who is pale, blonde hair, and green eyed, would probably cut you if you did not, if you disrespected her as a black woman. Because she has anger about the way we define people. Public health literature refers to allostatic load. What is the stress of being black in America? Now we have used, uh, talk, focused on black-white differences, and we just begin to discuss the differences between Asians and Latinos, and one of the reasons, one of the reasons is we don't find the data as clean, because we often, characterize Latinos as white. We often characterize Asians as white. And because we're so focused on phenotypic, descript uh, phenotypic descriptions of people, we make assumptions as opposed to ask. And so how does our allostatic load impact on our response to illness and disease? So what we are talking about today, I describe as a system failure on a national level. A huge portion of that failure is communication. <coughs> Aside from being boarded in internal medicine, I'm boarded in quality. And some of the things I learned about, when we look at the doctor-patient relationship, and what occurs in the examination room, <coughs> what we can quantify versus what we just have no idea about, we focus on that tiny part that we can quantify. So I'll come back to that. Um, when, we, when we look at quality data, we want to measure it. If we look, if we take physicians and we take patients and we put the patients and the physicians in a room, and after they come out of that exam room, we ask the physicians what we think happened in that room, and we ask the patients what they think happened in that room, there's a huge disparity. The physician may say, oh yeah, I talked to them about their blood pressure, I explained the importance of diet, I told them how to exercise, I gave them these points and told them about their medicine, and the patient says, she yelled at me. And no, they didn't get what was important or why they were being told to do this. And so when we talk about health care, medical care, what we do, how it's structured, where we think we're going, we haven't, we ha we haven't begun to talk about that communication piece. And since we can't quantify that, we focus on what was the blood pressure. What was the hemoglobin A1C, the measure of control of the diabetes? We don't quantify whether that a patient understood what was told to them or what was important. We don't quantify about whether that physician heard that patient's concerns or why they do what they do. So it's that gap between perception and reality that gap between what really happened in that exam room. In 2000, Cook County embarked upon a project to look at violence prevention. And we called it Project Brotherhood. 
It's because the trauma surgeons at County realized that so many of the people that they were sewing back together from violence were repeaters. You know, I sewed you up last year. Why are you back again this year? And so we began a project brotherhood, which did focus groups with dozens and dozens of black men. And why we focus on that, yes, they're victims of violence, but also black men have the highest age-adjusted all-cause mortality rates in the United States. They also have the highest age-adjusted death rates for preventable causes like cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, diabetes, HIV, and cancer. And yet black men are the least likely to utilize outpatient services, which is where we, as primary care providers, think that we're making an impact, think that we do something, think that we, we intervene in a way to prevent adverse outcomes. And so we had to ask why. So we, we looked at individual groups, we looked at men with HIV, we looked at men who had, men who had sex with men, we looked at men who were church affiliated, we looked at men who were um, young, we looked at men who were old, we looked at people who were victims of violence, and in, in these many groups, focus groups, some common themes came out. Why do they not utilize the healthcare delivery system in the way in which we intend for them to use it? Because it doesn't meet their needs. So yes, there was a lack of awareness, there's fear, <coughs> there's medical mistrust. While some may actually articulate knowledge of the Tuskegee experiment, where we get injected syphilis into black men and watch disease run its course, others have just inherited, through story or experience, a mistrust of university systems, a mistrust of people with white coats, a mistrust of a medical system that does not have their best interest in, at heart. And yes, there are cost issues involved, but there are cultural and linguistic issues and differences. A lack of trust verbalized many times of foreign providers, physicians who don't look like me, talk like me, or understand me. That's why they don't come, because they don't want to look stupid asking a question about something they don't understand. They were very articulate about how they would like to receive that information, how they would like to learn about their health. How can they intervene and make a difference and have a different outcome? I'm happy to say that you know it's, it, it's in danger of withering on the vine because the grant money has dried up, but Project Brotherhood goes on. And what we did is we recruited physicians, predominantly African-American male physicians, to provide care in this setting that these men found acceptable. So that while they're waiting to be seen by the doctor, that one of the physicians conducts a rap group and they discuss a health topic of interest to the members of the group. And that people can ask questions and they can learn from each other in an environment that is not uh, too structured or insulting or just you know, intimidating. But we have, if you don't come to the clinic on your time for your appointment, and you didn't get your prescription filled uh, the way we told you to do it, then, you know, too bad. And we understand that everybody can't meet that standard. That standard was created for somebody else at another time in another place. Are we concerned about providing health care? Are we concerned about educating the population? Or are we concerned about following the rules? So the healthcare delivery system in this country is structured for the convenience of the physician, not for the patients. If you have to work all day, and then you're tired, and then you're gonna come take a day off from work where you're not gonna get paid, because I'll remind you that half of the uninsured in this country are working people, and that you know the guys complaining about 
having somebody else's kids climb all over them while they're sitting in the waiting room all day. And then they wait all that time to see a doctor who only spends a few minutes with them. And they never felt like they had a chance to ask a question. So I have the pleasure, and it's aside from my many administrative duties, is, is to take care of patients. So I take care of patients on an outpatient basis, and I, I do ward service. So last week I was in the ward, on the ward seeing a patient that's in the hospital, teaching the residents and admitting patients. And I had a young gentleman, a Mexican gentleman, who doesn't speak English, who has diabetes, who has hypertension, who has, dialysis, who has uh, renal failure, and who's on dialysis. And he came in, he was very short of breath. And the history came that he was, he's very compliant, he's never missed a session, he gets his prescriptions. And so they were, the residents were very concerned about why this man was so short of breath. And I came in and saw him, and he was very uh, tachypnic, breathing very fast. And so um, we want, they wanted to get a CT scan to look at his chest to see if he might have a, a blood clot, a pulmonary embolus. And our protocol says if you have a dialysis patient who, who you want to get a CT on, you have to dialyze him first. So he went down for dialysis before I had a chance to fully examine him. And when he came back, he was breathing comfortably and he was laying flat in bed. And so I asked um, one of my uh, residents to come and see the patient with me. And my uh, resident was from Peru, a native speaker. And so we began to talk to this gentleman. And I asked him, why do you think that you were so short of breath? And he said, maybe because I smoked too much marijuana. <laughs> and I said, why do you smoke so much marijuana? He says, because I can't sleep. He said, I can't sleep. At night, I feel like the room is closing in on me. At night, it feels like my chest is going to, my, my heart is going to jump out of my chest. At night, I feel like something terrible will happen, and I can't sleep. And I told doctor after doctor after doctor, I can't sleep. Please give me something for sleep. And they won't. So I smoke marijuana because it helps me relax. And I said, huh. So when you smoke marijuana, you get hungry afterwards? Yes. And what do you eat? Do you watch your diet? He says, well, I don't respect the salt. <laughs> so this guy, who's been very compliant, who's been going to dialysis three days a week, never missing a time, but he's salt loading himself, he's sucking up fluid like a sponge, and when we dialyzed him and ultra filtered him, took off extra water, <coughs> he felt good. And he did that because no one was listening to his concern, to his problem. So he was self-medicating himself. He said, I don't like marijuana. It's expensive. It's illegal. It's hard for me to get. And then I have to figure out getting that between all of my appointments. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't listen. So you know, I, I could tell lots of stories, but I, I won't. I can say that misunderstandings have horrible outcomes for patients. Black, white, Hispanic, it doesn't matter, the whole system. But some of us are more adversely affected. Certain populations are more adversely affected than others. And the next thing I want to tell you that I think is crucial is that we understand that socioeconomic status is not a proxy for race. <coughs> In this country, black women who have gone to college have higher infant mortality rates than white women who have not finished high school. In this country, a black woman who is a college graduate has a higher rate, a higher mortality rate for breast cancer than a white woman who has not finished high school. Now overall, Black women have a lower incidence, a lower rate of breast cancer. But we tend to present younger, with more aggressive, and more advanced disease. And then our outcomes are worse. So if you go to the oncology literature, you will find that black women who have breast cancer, whether it's node negative or node positive, 
when you control for um, the size of the tumor, the location, the stage at presentation, that they're less likely to be offered chemotherapy than white men. And guess what? The ones who don't get chemotherapy have poorer outcomes. So what is race? And how are we going to deal with how that impacts health care in this country today? Thank you. Oh, another hard act to follow. So I'm going to start uh, just a little bit by talking about some of my experience over the last 20 years in trying to discuss racism in health care. And most of the people I know who identify as white really don't like the word racism. They don't like to talk about it. But what they like even less is white privilege, the concept of white privilege. So the reason I bring this up is it speaks to something I'm going to get to, which is when we talk about personally mediated racism, I mean personally mediated yeah, racism, or right? Um, we sometimes think just about interpersonal, like, <coughs> but really, policy is personally mediated. Right? Decisions about policy is personally mediated. It's mediated through human beings and the way that they think. So, I used to, when I first started out doing this, I would talk about racism in healthcare and the impact of racism on provider decision making. And I go back and forth on it about speaking truth versus being heard. So I have a set of slides I use that I hope will help me be heard. And I'm, you know, people can talk to me afterwards about that. So I uh, started out by talking to huge, like, you know, roomfuls of white physicians. This is just not that many black physicians. Uh, and they, went in the beginning, I would get hazed. I mean, the hostility was incredible. Right? Now, I get polite response, but it's the Teflon problem. People are like, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, and did you hear about this? So, okay, so, <laughs> no disrespect to Teflon. Um, so I'm gonna just go through these slides very quickly because I think I have an audience that knows this. You know that there are overwhelming inequities in healthcare, and I'm gonna say something about the over 900 peer-reviewed studies which is that these kinds of biases have created a burden of proof that you would almost never see in any other problem. Right? So our unconscious, when I say our, I'm talking about white people, our unconscious push away of this concept has made it very difficult for the research to penetrate and there are more and more studies. So we could do a few more studies on that. All right. Um, most do report on black-white differences, uh, and black is defined sometimes as self-identified or other-identified, and uh, the, but there is evidence for Hispanic, American Indian, and mixed evidence for Asian disadvantage. There's also a lot of evidence coming out about disadvantage for sexual minorities and obese individuals, among other socially ascribed and groups that have negative value assigned to them. So the disparities in care are somewhat due to health insurance, a lot. Um, lower SDS, uh, which really relates to ability to pay among the uninsured, and lower likelihood of receiving care at high-performing sites, but there's stuff that persists independent of that, and it's not changing all that much. So this is the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality report. They did uh, an assessment in 2005, 2010, and they found some change, which we could take a closer look at, but nowhere enough. And Dr. Yerby already mentioned this. The IOM studied this in 1999 and noticed that maybe there might be a racial bias problem. So there's a huge body of evidence, and I'll send you citations if you want, and often people would normally be asking me for the citations and then picking them apart, um, that racism intersects with really common and largely otherwise adaptive cognitive processes to affect really big differences in what happens in healthcare encounters. So it's been shown to affect what, what do you ask, right? How do you make decisions? 
How, do you refer, do you not refer? How do you manage symptoms? And what are the treatment recommendations? So, you know a sweet slide? <laughs> it's a date, right? So some of what I do, and, and, and some of what I do, because this creates, you know, we talked about allostatic load. These topics, so I'm a social psychologist, can you tell? <laughs> um, so these topics create a lot of physiologic anxiety in everybody, in everybody. So sometimes when I do these, I'll, I'll try to do a few things that actually will lower threat. One of the things that's been shown to lower threat, both stereotype threat for someone who's in, someone who's black or someone who's in the other undervalued group, as well as white stereotype threat, right? White people stereotype threat, racist, is to have everybody sit for a minute, not look at the slide, close your eyes or not, and think about the deep values that brought you here today, the deepest, deepest values. And connect with them on a gut level. Okay, moving along, I guess we're 10 minutes. Okay, so the research suggests that for many of you, not most of you, some of the cortisol has decreased. And the reason that I do that is because I'm completely self-serving and I want everyone to listen to me and hear what I say. No, no, actually, I worry a lot about stereotype threat. I worry a lot about um, the impact of the constant conversation on this, on my black friends and colleagues. So some of that actually can lower the allostatic load of stereotype threat. Okay, so we don't think the way we think we think and this is part of the problem. I'm not saying there isn't any conscious, self-aware racism, we know there is. But a lot of what's going on here is going on at the subconscious level, but it has a very, pa it manifests itself very powerfully, and it does not negate responsibility. Because you're not aware of something doesn't mean you're not responsible for it. There are two cognitive systems. One is the one that we believe is the one we're using all the time, and actually are probably not using much more than 10 to 20% of the time. And the other one is an automatic system. And it's a system that was created to allow us to survive. If we had to actually consciously think about some vast stimuli in our world before we knew how to act, we would have died out as a species. So a lot of what we do is just, it's effortless, it's fast, you know, you walk into a lecture hall, if you, most of this group will have been to so many, you know exactly what to do, you don't have to wonder about it, there's no energy expended, so that's great. You look at an apple, so fast, you know what it is, you may have a feeling associated with it, this process, is extremely nuanced in the social world because we're a social species, but I'll move on. So when individuals are assigned to a class or group, especially if they are assigned to a class or group that has negatively ascribed values, or positively actually, there's an automatic, very rapid response. It's an effective emotional response based on that group. And Jonathan Haidt has studied this and talked about this and um, some of the, um, especially the ethics people here may have read his work, you may like it or dislike it, but basically what he said is most, most ethical arguments are basically rationale for the effective response, the emotional response. Okay. So there's been declines in explicit but not implicit. There's conclusive evidence that implicit bias affects behavior. So this is a kind of complicated model. It's uh, from uh, uh, an article that some colleagues and I put out a couple years ago on uh, the impact of racism on cl clinician everything. <laughs> the piece that I just uh, circled is really some of the steps that happen in clinical encounters. This is some of the patient factors, and you mentioned, I think um, we were just hearing about this, that some of what happens when people come in, so patients, is that they have a lot of experiences that affect how they interact in the healthcare system, and if we've been devalued or humiliated in, a, in a, any kind of setting, when we come back, we're definitely memory, learning, cognitive ability, speech errors. So I'm moving right through this because I already told you this and I'm gonna ask you to believe me. Um, so this is a study showing use of thrombolysis, thromb thrombolysis and thrombolysis? Thrombolysis. Yeah, thrombolysis. Um, among black patients compared to white patients, there were racial differences, but more importantly, <coughs> the degree of racial difference was connected to unconscious or implicit bias. 
Similar kinds of findings uh, that Janice Sabin and colleagues had for children for pain medication following surgery. The other problem is that we see everything through the framework that is created by our automatically activated beliefs and feelings. Remember, I, our beliefs are often like lawyers for our emotions. So the way that things are interpreted and the steps that occur affect um, what people learn, which affects how they act, which then goes back and reinforces their original beliefs and then affects treatment. So for example, um, disparities in identification of autism, depression, and ADHD have been linked to differences in provider intake or assessment behaviors. So it creates differences in information elicited resulting in biases and diagnoses. There's also evidence, considerable evidence, that implicit bias, and about 80% of American white, including physicians and everybody else, uh, have negative implicit bias towards blacks, is associated with more verbal dominance, affects the quality of the encounter, patient-centered care. But I'm gonna go to this one, because this is, this is so fascinating and so important, and I hope we can um, do some more studies, because this one study is convincing the people that I, that I need to convince, it's all about me. Um, so Penner and colleagues looked at the relationship between clinician implicit bias and patient ratings of care. And they also videotaped it and coded it. And black women's ratings of the physician, the trust, their experience with the physician, was more highly associated with the physician's implicit bias than anything else that anyone could even discern in coding the encounters. Okay? So we know, don't we? And the problem is, is that, ooh, did I do that? Um, the problem is, one of the big problems and the, one of the big contributors to allostatic load is the disconnect between the genuine conscious intent, let's say, in this case, of a white person, genuinely believing in social justice and egalitarianism. This isn't fake, this is true, right? Internalized implicit bias through repeated negative exposures, associating black Americans with negative things, and then nonverbal behavior is affected by the implicit process. Verbal behavior is affected by the explicit, and it's confusing as anything. And I, the level of stress, you know, <coughs> looking at this from other, like there's studies showing that this is part of what happens in, in um, families that generate mental illness, is a disconnect between verbal and nonverbal. Okay, so this is another little piece of allostatic load that sometimes gets overlooked. So the structural, in healthcare, you know, one big structural thing we could do is to eliminate the profit motive, but I'll put that aside because I think I was asked about individual and organizational. So we know that there are things that have been very effective <coughs> in preventing us from being hijacked by implicit processes that are not consistent with our conscious motivation. We know, there's been many studies showing that. Self-awareness, contact, Looking, actively looking for the counter stereotype, that actually works for a while, like looking at counter stereotype images, it's a bias, it just goes right down. Uh, motion regulation skills is important when people are feeling negative, all negative, um, there are two reasons, it absorbs resources, so we're relying on our implicit processes more because we don't have enough resources, um, but also it just triggers a lot of negative reactions. One of the most robust and powerful factors that individuals can use to prevent themselves from being hijacked by implicit bias, and I'm looking at you because you're part of, I don't know, one in five, so. Hey, here's the pins, one in five. <laughs> um, is to make sure you spend a few minutes imagining yourself in the other person's shoes. This is a cognitive type of perspective taking. It is a very powerful way to overcome the impact of implicit bias on encounters. So we know this. We know partnership building skills. We can create a common in-group, right? We work together, we have a common in-group, overcomes bias because we have this, you know, now we're together in the same group. Okay, I'm moving this along. Um, I, there's some evidence, like for all the white people in Minnesota, where I come from, um, that imagery, guided imagery of contact actually has beneficial effects. All right, uh, sorry about this. I don't have enough time, but I can show, send you this. Okay, organizations. The first thing that I, one of the reasons I came, I mean, I, I would have come anyway, but 
where are the lawyers, right? We know that there are things we can do. 20 minutes. We do. So we can't be held accountable for, you know, a, an unconscious process. I get that, right? But we can be held accountable for putting into place the procedures and processes that we know should reduce this. Now again, I'm all at the level of unintended, right? Because then we know that's not all the all there is, but that's where I am right now in this conversation. So we know that cognitive load, we know stressful situations increases reliance on implicit processes because of efficiency, right? We don't have any energy. So if I am, I'm a psychotherapist, I am exhausted, I'm seeing person after person after person, I am depleted, my implicit functioning takes over. And it's kind of adaptive because I won't run the road, but it's not so adaptive for the next patient I see if that patient tends to be, is in a group that I have negative implicit attitudes towards. Organizational, <laughs> stop, organizational racial climate matters. I, I have to, okay, uh, la, da, 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 da. Cool. so uh, what I would create identity cues. Okay, there's something I wanna say, and then I'm done. And that is that we do know a lot, we can help hold organizations accountable for putting into place, and, and also hold providers accountable for doing their best to learn the skills we know will reduce the likelihood they're gonna be hijacked by biases and counters. But I have a huge study of medical students. I just got, I've been looking at this, and the huge study of medical students, 4,732 students from the first year to fourth year, and we just picked up the fourth year measures, and I just got this today, and I am very depressed. The black medical students increased negative racial bias. So um, black Americans kind of cluster around neutral, right? White Americans kind of like skew, about 80% negative. The black medical students started out, right, like just like every other black American clusters, now they're, now they're over it. And it's really depressing, and it's really disturbing. Here's the good news, though. The good news is that Racial climate in these medical schools lowered racial implicit bias. It actually did. I don't know if I would, that's a hypothesis, but I don't know if I would have had it. So there are certain aspects of racial climate in medical schools that were associated with lower drops in implicit racial bias and explicit among medical students. So again, we know there are things we can do. briefly introduce Dr. Mary Frances Berry, who is a Geraldine R. Siegel Professor of American Social Thought and Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania, where she teaches history of American law and advises graduate students in legal history and African American history. She was appointed by President Carter and confirmed by the Senate as Commissioner on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights after President Reagan fired her for criticizing his civil rights policies, and I have to say I didn't know he had any, um, <laughs> she sued him and won reinstatement in federal district court. In 1993, President Clinton designated her chairperson of the Civil Rights Commission. She was reappointed to a six-year term in January 1999. She resigned from the commission on December 7, 2004, and during her tenure, there were a number of reports issued about uh, government, uh, particularly Health and Human Services, uh, in um, Title VI. And so she's going to talk briefly just about her time on the commission and health disparities um, and what the government did during that time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I must say that my experience with uh, healthcare and uh, the whole issue of my personal experience with healthcare and healthcare disparities and discrimination, I was sitting there thinking while I was listening to the last presentation that I'd give you one example because I like stories before I tell you about the mundane things about the commission and all the where it was and where it's going and where it's been and hey. Uh, at a place where I spent a lot of time in the summer, uh, friends of mine call it um, summering and at this place, but I spend time there. Um, they, um, and I, they have a system of clinics up and down in the towns that are all directed ultimately by the same person. 
um, in addition to the kind of public funding they get, they raise money. So one year, the director for the whole system asked me if I would talk, give a talk uh, at a big dinner she was going to have to raise money. Uh, and she thought I would be able to attract a lot of people to come to this dinner. So I agreed because I had from time to time gone over to the clinic and had a nail removed that I stepped on or something. And I thought it's a great idea to let these clinics operate. And I gave this speech and a huge crowd came and she raised a lot of money and she was very happy about this. But then about two weeks later, I had an upper respiratory infection and I wasn't getting any better. So finally I gave up and I went over to the clinic and there was a uh, physician who had rotated from one of the other clinics who was there that day. Uh, I waited for a long time sitting out there in the waiting room with no one waiting on me. And then finally, they called me in and I went in to sit down with him and he looked at me and he said, now what's the matter? You can tell me and I, I have enough time to listen while you get it together, what, what, just tell me what's wrong. <laughs> So I started telling him that I had a, something wrong with, you know, I had an upper respiratory infection. He said, my, my, do you know what that expression means? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking to myself, not only am I well educated, but in my iteration before I became a philosopher and a historian and a lawyer, I was a scientist and I was the uh, medical laboratory uh, technologist and I ran a lab in the evenings at a 525 bed hospital in Ann Arbor called St. Joe's Hospital, which I did for about four years. And I sure know things about hospitals and, <laughs> and anyway, I'm intelligent. So I was looking at him trying to figure out what his problem was. And um, so I told him, and then he said, no, that's all right, you, you just wait, I'll figure out what's wrong with you. And so that was the way in which he uh, treated me. And I was quite offended, to tell you the truth. I didn't know why I was offended, but I thought maybe my blood pressure had gone up or something. It goes up anyway when you go to the doctor. Um, and I left, but the more I thought about it, uh, in the next few days, I thought, this is ridiculous. I wonder if they treat everybody like that who, when they don't know who they are. So I called the woman who was the director, and I said, you know all that money I raised for you <laughs> over there, and you wanted me to go in there? And I said, I told her what happened. She was outraged, of course, because she said, he obviously needs some kind of sensitivity training, or we need to fire him. She actually fired him. But uh, I thought to myself, now if I had gone there, and if I had, um, I had on some shorts and a t-shirt when I went there, it was a beach, let me look. Uh, if I had gone there all dressed up for success, and uh, had someone call and said, I was the person who came and did the dinner and the ba da 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 da, maybe it would have been different, I don't know. But it seemed to me that that was an example that I ought to give you about, I don't know what it all means, but my experience with, with uh, health care and what happens even nowadays. Now on the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the way I framed the question I was gonna talk to you about this in this brief presentation was whether there are racial disparities and bias in healthcare today despite the Civil Rights Act. And I've had the answer from listening and whatever. Yes, there are disparities. Uh, despite the Civil Rights Act of 64, and can we expect any better with the Affordable Care Act, popularly known as Obamacare? I think the answer is whether we can expect any better uh, is probably no, but maybe. I'll put it that way. I think about the school inequities report that the Office for Civil Rights uh, issued just uh, last week sometime. And the head of the office was on television and I saw her and she was everywhere explaining the report which showed that there are still inequities in education, that black school children and Latino school children to a lesser extent but still uh, go to schools where they have poor education. They get suspended more than everybody else 
and some of the schools don't even have the courses that they need, even if they stay in school, they graduate and they still don't have them. And this, the, what I thought about when I listened to that was when I ran education in the Carter administration before I was on the commission, I was head of the education, federal education programs for three years. And when I headed up those programs, I got reports every single year which said exactly the same thing this report said that came out. School suspensions, we call them push-outs uh, in those days. Uh, schools where people didn't have the classes that they needed. Uh, and the Office of Civil Rights, uh, we used to engage in education with them in all kinds of meetings about what we were gonna do about it. When I was on the Civil Rights Commission, I did several hearings down in, uh, in various states on education. And I remember in one particular hearing where the state school superintendent was asked to address data that showed that there were high schools that black children went to where they did not teach math uh, and they did not teach science. And uh, I asked him, I never will forget this, it's in the records of the Civil Rights Commission that you can get online. How did he explain that? <laughs> what about if kids didn't drop out and stayed in school and they graduated and they wanted to go to college and they hadn't had these courses? And he said, well, you know, it was a matter of money and it was a matter of not being able to uh, find people. And I pressed him and he finally said, well, you know, we spend most of the money up in the northern part of the state uh, and you wouldn't want us to stop, cut the funding up there now, would you? <laughs> so uh, uh, I didn't answer. But anyway, so the problem uh, persists. Um, and there are, and I'm sure you've talked about it, all kinds of evidence of disparities, so I won't think about it, but one, talk, talk about it, everything from breast cancer to all kinds of stuff that's been in the news. But I think of HIV AIDS and the disinterest on the part of many of the uh, wealthy people I meet with who are funding stuff uh, in uh, advocacy uh, on HIV or on uh, LBGT issues and who are not really interested in the black and Latino AIDS sufferers who are affected, and in particular black women, that in terms of their funding and where they put their money and where the advocacy groups work, the LBGT groups in particular, they uh, want to work on a whole lot of issues, but they're not interested in working on, they say HIV AIDS, you know, it's under control because we have this cocktail now, and most of the people that they know personally uh, have the cocktail, uh, and that they don't even have to worry about transmission anymore, which is stupid. Uh, but with all the data about who has AIDS and what's going on, and if they are concerned about LBGT people in uh, particular, uh, you think that they would sort of dissect their uh, concerns and pay some attention, but I have a hard time getting them uh, to do so. I also think uh, one other little story, I was thinking about my mother when I was sitting there, how she called me one time when she was in her 80s and said, I have a cataract and I went to the doctor and I told him that there's some new laser thing that they do, that they replace the lens with. I heard about it and I saw it on TV and I want one of those. And he told me there's no such thing. So she said, Is, am, I crazy? am I going crazy? <laughs> did I really see that you know, on TV? And of course she did see it on TV and of course it did exist, but this doctor told her. And so I called the doctor and the doctor said, well, I just thought she couldn't afford it. Now, um, he, he, I made, her, made, made him give it to her, but the point was that there was no reason for him to assume that my mother couldn't afford something, and when she, in fact, asked him about it, to tell her, to tell that old woman that there was no such thing, when she kept saying, I saw it on TV, I saw it on TV, and he just kept telling her that she had not seen such a thing, and she should forget about it. Uh, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, of course, prohibits discrimination uh, uh, in any institution that receives federal funding. And that sounds simple. If the institution discriminates, you can show it does, and they get federal funding, the funding will be cut off, right? No. 
Uh, Health care providers of all kinds are included, of course, not just uh, hospitals and nursing homes and doctors, but you know, Medicaid programs, anything that's a recipient of federal financial uh, assistance. And the Civil Rights Commission did a lot of hearings and investigations before the Civil Rights Act was passed on hospitals uh, and issued a lot of reports on the fact that people were excluded or ill-treated or whatever. Nursing homes in particular, which were awful then and are awful now for most people and are worse for blacks and Latinos uh, and any poor folk. Uh, but in any case, uh, the commission did all these reports to support uh, Title VI being, uh, being enacted when it was, and in particular in the health area. And after it was passed, the commission did several uh, reports year after year on what is happening in these medical, uh, in the medical uh, field uh, based on the Civil Rights Act and are things getting better? You can tell from the titles of them the kind of things they were looking at, and these reports are all available, and you can compare them with what's going on today. Uh, one year later, a survey of all the hospitals that have, de have desegregated in the South and what's happening and who's in them and how are they treated. Uh, access to health professions for uh, minorities. Uh, health insurance and employment opportunities. And this one in particular that uh, the commission did uh, after I got there, minority elderly access to health care and nursing homes uh, with uh, a lot of good data on what was going on there. And then finally, this big report that came out in 1999 had two volumes. The first one was on disparities. These were all based on hearings going around to different places all over the country and data analysis. Uh, all the disparities in the health care programs and the second one was on enforcement. What is the Civil Rights Act, what is the Civil Rights Office in the department doing about these disparities? And are they finding evidence of discrimination and are they weeding it out and are they saying it has to stop? I mean, that was a question that the commission asked. And the answer that the commission gave was basically no, <laughs> that they were not. And the commission made a lot of recommendations. And the recommendations, some of them have been implemented, that their minority health office should be expanded in, H in, the, in the agency, which was then HHS by that time, uh, and that they should look at sociocultural context of individuals' lives when designing and reviewing health programs, things like that. They should work on the uh, getting females and people of color included in health-related research. There have been, has been a lot of progress on that. Uh, and uh, implementation of programs at the community level uh, and relating them to organizations that serve women and people of color. So that's, that was good. On the enforcement side, what they said was that the reason why not much was being done, this is in 1999, and it's still the same today, uh, that OCR does not have adequate staff to enforce all of the mandates that are under their supervision. They have education, they have health, they have everything uh, that is related to um, 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 those areas. Um, and they don't have enough staff if they were going to go out and cover the whole country, even in their regional offices to go about doing compliance reviews in hospitals. I don't know if any of you have uh, worked in or been in hospitals, but how many uh, uh, compliance reviews have been undertaken by uh, HHS? The whole time I was uh, working in the health field, I never saw a compliance review come to do anything. Uh, the likelihood of a compliance review uh, coming in is that you will win, the same as is you will win the lottery and get a you know a million bucks <laughs> or something uh, because they don't have any staff, uh, enough staff to do that. And most of their staff works in the education field, K through 12 and higher education. And they don't have enough staff uh, to actually do that. And what they did is Title VI, as it was originally set up with its uh, regulations, provided that the agency could terminate funds if they found discrimination. The law provides that and the regs. Uh, but uh, there was an additional requirement made later 
they couldn't terminate funds unless they first reported it to the president, uh, the, the Congress, uh, both houses of Congress that reviewed them and the committees and got their agreement <laughs> that they could do it, okay? Uh, what is the likelihood then <laughs> Uh, that they would be able to do that even if they uh, wanted to. i tell you another little story about fund termination. Uh, after I was out of Edfield and I was provost at the University of Maryland College Park, um, I uh, was asked to be a consultant, this was in the Nixon administration, to help them enforce the civil rights laws on college and universities' campuses and tell them how to do it, since I knew about this stuff. And I went down there as a consultant, and one day they told me, the staff said, we have this multi-million dollar contract, almost a billion dollars, to go to Columbia University. And, but we have in our files all these complaints that they discriminate. And we've, in fact, investigated and found out that they do. <laughs> so what are we supposed to do? I said, well, let me see. Fun termination, that's a great idea. Why don't you send them a notice that you're going to terminate their funds? Because after all, they got uh, uh, a review before uh, of some complaints that were filed, and the agency operates mainly on complaints that are filed instead of compliance reviews, because they don't have anybody to do compliance reviews by and large. They need more people. Um, and that time we resolved it by Columbia saying, from now on, we won't discriminate anymore. <laughs> and they signed a statement saying they wouldn't do it anymore. And now they've done it again, so what are we to do? I said, just tell them, you know, all bets are off. Notify them that as of X time that you're holding up, you're barring this contract, we call it. They won't get this money until they mend their ways. They did it. The staff did it. Amazing. Thunder came down from the sky. <laughs> and the then secretary of HEW, who was a guy named Cap Weinberg, Casper. Cap called down and told the head of the office, what do you think you're doing down there? They said, well, Mary Berry told us <laughs> that this is what we're supposed to do, and that's what the law says. I don't care who Barry Barry is. Do you realize that the president of Columbia has called me up and a couple of my buddies who are doing X, Y, and Z at this firm and that firm, and by golly, you stop. You go up there right now and take everybody with you on the staff, and don't you come back until you resolve this, and by no means are you going to terminate this funding. So they asked me if I would go with them. So I said, yeah, this would be interesting. So I went up to Columbia. <laughs> And we went into the president's office, ushered into the provost's office, nice conference room. <laughs> and we sat down, and the guy said, um, uh, I want to explain to you, you see, what we did is we hired three men for some particular positions here for which they were well-suited and qualified, the best in the whole country, uh, and we didn't advertise the jobs. And what had happened is a whole bunch of women had complained to HEW that they never advertised the jobs, they never had a, a chance to apply for them, and how is this fair? But they said they're the best people, you know, so we had no alternative but to get these good people when we could get them. And I'm gonna prove this to you because I'm gonna have them come in one by one and you can question them <laughs> about their qualifications. So we sat there and the first guy walked through the door he walked through the door and he looked around and he saw me and he ran out of the room. <laughs> he ran literally out of the room. And the provost said, hey, come back. Bob, what's going on? What's, what's the problem? And the guy was out. He was calm. Nobody knew why he ran out of the room, but I did. <laughs> because when I was at the University of Michigan, which was shortly before that, in the history department, a guy didn't get tenure, young assistant professor, because he was a terrible teacher, and he didn't publish anything. So he didn't get tenure. He was a Columbia PhD. He needed a job. So he came back home to Columbia to get a job, and they hired him for this job, to be assistant vice president for 
gosh knows what. And he knew that I knew. <laughs> and that's why he left. So in fact, when the, I left then, because I said, you guys have to resolve this. So, but they didn't terminate the funding. They gave them the funding anyway. Uh, and that's been the pattern. And that's been uh, a couple of times when I was running education uh, uh, in HEW, I tried to cut off some funding from somebody. And so funding is like, it is something that you can threaten people with or you can make them think you're gonna do something, but in fact, you're not gonna do anything. Maybe I shouldn't tell you that. Uh, in fact, they, and the reason why they don't is because most of the Title VI issues right now that OCR uh, handles that have to do with the medical field are based on hospital closings of race. When hospitals are closed in neighborhoods and people say that they're affected negatively, they complain and they look into the complaints and try to come up with some arbitrate, some kind of remedy like a clinic being set up that will substitute for some of the functions, which is inadequate, but at least it's something. But the great bulk of race cases are about that. There are a lot of language access issues uh, where people need assistance uh, and they try to work out something so that that can be given. And there are a number of disability cases which are cross-cutting because many of the people in the disability complaint field are people of color or people who lead language assistance. So you get a cross-cut there. But those are what the great bulk of cases that they have are not about people in nursing homes or who can't get access to certain nurse. And if you go to nursing homes all over this country, I, when, through my mother's long illness, I've visited lots of nursing homes. So I know about nursing homes. Uh, and in fact, you will find there's segregation in many parts of the country as far as racial segregation, as far as nursing homes are concerned. And as I said, you will find that many of them are uniformly of bad quality, <laughs> depending on what they are, most expensive ones, but that that is still the case. And in some parts of the country, you will find still that in hospitals, there's a great deal of, they don't call it segregation, racial isolation. <laughs> in some of the hospitals, which uh, still goes on. And that is aside from, and then my uh, last story for you, and then I'm done. Uh, well, I'll tell you this, and then I'll be done. I won't tell you another story. Do you want another story? No. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you that last story, and then I'll be done. Uh, my, uh, my internal medicine uh, doctor told me, uh, she tells me all the time, she's known for diagnosing, if anything can be diagnosed, she will find it. Um, and uh, she says, you know, your red blood cells are too large. So she has been wondering over the years, and finally she sent me to a derma, uh, what do you call it, um, hematologist. And uh, the guy who usually handled that retired, and he handed it over to some young guy. And I went and the guy said, oh yes, it is true that your blood cells are too large. So I think what we should have is transfusions. <laughs> because, you know, he was one of those, like she says that in medical school you're taught not to see zebras when, something about zebras. Yeah, you shouldn't say zebras or something. And uh, he thought that when he heard hoofbeats, there were zebras. So he said, we should do, maybe we should do transfusions. <laughs> I said, transfusions, <laughs> isn't that a little extreme, you know? And he said, oh, well, you know, we want to do it before it's too late. And he could see that he was just anxious to try out these <laughs> transfusions and do all these things to me. And I said, well, but my red blood cells have been large for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And that Carol just sort of, every time she says, your red blood cells are no large. And I said, well, maybe it has something to do with because I'm a runner. I don't know, but I am, or maybe they've always been that way. So he was quite annoyed because I wouldn't let him do these uh, blood transfusions. <laughs> then he said, but there is some uh, new sort of medication, and he knew nothing about me except that Carol had sent me, uh, that you could get that's an advanced whatever, but he said, oh no, you can't afford that, that's too expensive, <laughs> which reminded me of my mother and her expense. Of course, needless to say, I remembered that I am a Penn faculty member and that Penn happens to have a pretty good hospital and some pretty good doctors. So I went over there to get a second opinion and they said, hey, so what if they're big? If nothing's happening, <laughs> let it go. Uh, and finally, let me just say that the, under the Affordable Care Act, 
the burden has been made greater for the Office for Civil Rights because now they're responsible for enforcing the non-discrimination provisions of the Affordable Care Act. Now, I've already told you they can't <laughs> enforce <laughs> the provisions of this. They don't have enough budget to begin to enforce any of this stuff. So, oh, and fraud termination, of course, is impossible. Uh, compliance reviews, there need to be more of them. Uh, if there were more compliance reviews and you knew that systematically you were on a review schedule, it would really help to try to do something about these problems. And the other is that those people who need help the most, who are most likely to be victimized by these things, aren't mobilized. And they are the ones with the least information and the least knowledge. Somebody needs to advocate and mobilize the community people around these issues of health care. It's one of the great missing things in this whole field that would get something done because then you would get a response. So all I can say finally is that if you can do what it says in the paper you gave me, develop concrete legal, medical, and policy solutions to end racial bias in health care, <laughs> and a plan to do that, more power to you. Thank you. It's really hard to follow up Dr. Barry, so I will be really, really brief. Um, this is uh, Martin Luther King, one of the uh, quotes I like by him. And this was in 1966. He says, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Um, I'm not going to spend any time talking about institutional bias from a uh, definitional uh, perspective. I'm sure that you've already covered that. Um, but just as an example, I'm sure Dr. Yerby talked about uh, the Hill Burton Act, which is something, an act that allowed for separate but equal hospital facilities. Th this is an example of a law that reflects um, inequities and also um, produces inequities. Another example is credentialing decisions that a lot of hospitals would not allow black physicians on their medical staff, which in turn meant that black patients couldn't be treated in those hospitals. This is a policy that uh, has a significant adverse impact on uh, patients of color. Again, this is a modern definitional uh, a view of institutional bias. I really won't go into it too much because this is more for my law students probably than for this conference. Some examples of institutional bias that have come up recently, uh, managed care <coughs> contracting decisions in the early uh, 2000s, I believe it was exactly the year 2000, the National Medical Association alleged that HMOs were discriminating against them. That is, they were not uh, entering into provider contracts, and provider contracts are important because you want to be on one of the exclusive or preferred, preferred provider panels when there's an HMO in town. The HMOs allege, no, we're not discriminating. It's a certain criteria we look for. We look for doctors who practice in large groups rather than solo or one or two practitioners. 
most black physicians uh, don't practice in large groups. They also said they, they were interested in physicians who were board certified. There's a 10% disparity between board certification between black and white physicians. And there are others. A rationale was that they wanted physicians who used a uh, few resources, healthcare resources, in order to lower costs. And often black physicians uh, use a lot of resources because their patients are sicker. So these were all facially neutral uh, yeah. policies in how they made their contracting decisions, but they had a significant adverse impact on physicians of color. Uh, Dr. Yerby, uh, is an expert on nursing homes, so I will defer to her expertise uh, on this subject. Uh, a form of institutional bias that's not often discussed, but has been discussed somewhat today, is uh, the hurdles uh, that have to be navigated uh, by poor people and also uh, patients of color. What happens if an HMO uh, does not agree uh, to pay for a procedure? How difficult is the appeals process made? Uh, suppose you finally get through the appeal. Uh, there's difficulty in contacting and making appointments with specialists. And then the time arrives for the for medical procedure. Are the instructions uh, adequate? Sometimes the instructions for certain uh, procedures are confusing and contradictory. Um, institutional bias, here I'm looking at the healthcare system. Uh, there was a study in 2013 that looked at uh, black-white breast cancer mortality rates in the 50 largest cities. Um, in Los Angeles, for example, a black woman is more than 70% more likely to die of breast cancer than a white woman. And 20 years ago, the rates were similar in most US cities. And this implicates uh, structural factors, and a personal bias, and also institutional factors. And again, I'm concentrating on the institutional factors. The traditional view of why there was this disparity was that black women uh, were not screened early and often enough. But the CDC now reports that the rates of screening are, are basically comparable. So then the question arises, what happens after the screening? Recent work shows that even when black and white women have uh, similar insurance, uh, the wait after a diagnosis, if, if there's an abnormal um, mammogram, there is a, a difference in the wait. And also there's a difference in the wait time in which uh, black and white women start to receive treatment. And as a number of the speakers point out, that um, black women are, are more likely to be recommended for palliative care at uh, all stages rather than curative care. And how can this situation, this institutional uh, bias uh, be addressed? Harlem Hospital in New York uh, started something called a Navigator Program. That is a program that walks a woman through the entire process. She gets an abnormal mammogram, um, and then the Navigator helps with insurance, specialists, et cetera. When I talk about medicine as an institution, I'm not referring it to it as physicians practicing in any organization. I'm talking about the practice of medicine itself. Are there things within the practice of medicine that give rise to health disparities? A number of uh, recent scholars have looked at the idea of clinical discretion. There are a number of options for any given uh, medical condition. And because of this discretion, it gives rise or a pathway to certain cognitive uh, processes or priors, which uh, Dr. Van Dyke has 
talks about. So we're, she's talking about it, this type of uh, uh, bias from a, in a personal perspective. My writing looks at it more from an institutional perspective. And there's certain uh, stereotypes that well-meaning physicians have uh, that they might not know about it. So with that, Thank you. Well, have the uh, pleasure of being a last speaker here. I'm amazed at how many people are as, still as alert and uh, responsive as, as you are. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, not about Ohio, but I want to talk a little bit about the town where I live, Chicago. Chicago, as you all know, is the home to our first African-American president. And it's also historically and continually the most segregated metropolitan area in the United States. I work in a newborn intensive care unit. I take care of sick babies. But during my um, off months, I do research. And my research is focused on trying to figure out why we have so many premature babies, especially uh, among the more oppressed sections of our population. Infant mortality in the United States has two very striking features. First of them is it's very high for a rich country. We now rank 30th in the world in terms of our infant mortality rate. And the other striking feature, of course, is the one we've been talking about today, the dramatic uh, disparity uh, between different social groups. Now, I want to point something out, though, that hasn't been pointed out previously, and that is that the disparity is not just a black-white disparity um, or even just a class disparity. There's if you look at the uh, third line in this table here, U.S. white infants, if we rank their infant mortality rate as if they were a separate country, would still rank 28th in the world, almost three times as high as Hong Kong, which was the lowest for that year, 2000. So we have a couple of different kinds of inequality, inequity, disparity to deal with if we want to see improvement in the infant mortality picture in this country. One of them is why does a black baby have 2.3 times the risk of dying as a white baby? And the other one is why do all American babies have like three times or three and a half times the risk of dying as the babies in the best performing systems in the world? After all, we spend more than everybody else. We research more than anybody else. Why do our babies die more? Also, a word about words. Um, I, will, uh, I am in the process of training, retraining myself to not use the word disparity <coughs> and start talking about inequity or inequality. Um, as recently as 2010, when the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities was established, it perpetuated the language that was initi initiated a few decades earlier, in which a conscious political decision was made to use this neutral term of disparities. Um, but I also want to point out that this institute implies that the disparities only apply to minorities. And that is, in fact, not the case. The majority of infants in this country are dying at a drastically higher rate than they ought to be. <coughs> and it is that separation in the identity politics, if you will, that in many ways have weakened us and made us unable to rectify the situation politically. The um, United Nations WHO Commission on the Social Determinants of Health um, also chose to use value-laden language when discussing uh, the gap uh, in health outcomes around the world. The social gradient in health within countries is caused by the unequal distribution of power, income, goods, and services. They say, furthermore, that this unequal distribution is not in any sense, a natural phenomenon. It's related to policy and politics. 
talent. This slide simply shows uh, the two most important ingredients. Um, does this? We have a. Uh, yes. Okay. So the clusters of bars are by ethnic groups, so black, white, and within each one, uh, we have years of education. So you can see that a woman who has dropped out of high school, a white woman who's dropped out of high school, has three times the risk of losing her baby as a white woman who's graduated from college. But that woman still has less risk than an African American woman who's graduated from college. How do we measure socioeconomic status? Well, typically we use education, occupation, and income. But, uh, I'll pay attention to this. Uh, life. Is a, is a longer process, and health outcomes such as birth uh, don't just occur based on what happened in the last nine months. So I'm gonna talk about two different approaches we've used to try to get at more of the big picture, the life course picture. One of them is looking at wealth as opposed to income at some particular point in time. And this reveals much starker gaps between black and white than we would see so the income. And the second one is one where we've tried to use health data and by connecting with a census tract, looked at points, uh, two points in time in a woman's income. This is just an income map of Chicago and uh, you will recognize that these yellow areas which represent the lowest income happen to coincide with the largest areas of African American population on the west side and the south side. And as the UN Commission pointed out, this is by no means a natural phenomenon. It can be traced in public policy going back to the Constitution of the United States, which enshrined slavery uh, and enslaved persons as being three-fifths of a human being. But it continued on through the annexation of Mexican lands, the Chinese Exclusion Act, English-only acts, and so forth. There, uh, I'm gonna talk a bit more about these loan programs, which are very important for racial segregation. Um, but uh, we did see, as has been talked about quite a bit, a bit of a turnaround in the 60s with all the turbulence and political uprising. Um, but unfortunately, much of the um, improvement in equity, we might even we refer to home ownership as equity, the equity was lost uh, with the housing bubble. So mechanism, of redlining has already been referred to. This goes back to 1933 when the Homeowners Loan Corporation uh, set up a program and they estimated risks of loan default. And it just so happened that they assigned uh, default ratings that were so high for black neighborhoods that essentially no one black could qualify for one of these federal loans. Later when the FHA and VA were set up, they used the same rules. So that when Chicago was in the post-war period, the suburban boom funded by the VHA and, uh, and VA and FHA programs was mostly white people in the suburbs. And we had other systemic things. A highway of 14 lanes was built on the borderline between the white and black sections of Chicago. Uh, here's a picture of the route of the Dan Ryan Expressway, the purple, Census tracts have greater than 90% African American population, and they took, of course, the westernmost strip of this uh, and actually plowed that under and made that into the highway. Mm -hmm. um, so a variety of policies starting a long time ago and continuing to the present, um, and very well documented by sociologists, Massey and Denton, who used the term hypersegregation to refer to metropolitan areas like Chicago, described a lot of this, and the actual mechanisms William Julius Wilson uh, and many others have talked about the elimination of job opportunities. Um, we've all heard about health deserts, uh, food deserts, et cetera. Well, the result of all this up into a few years ago was already a striking wealth gap um, where we might see 50% uh, average higher income for an African American versus a white uh, worker, um, we would see nine times or 10 times or 11 times the net worth uh, for that family. 
Uh, that was 2006. After the housing bubble uh, with uh, intentional marketing of subprime uh, mortgages in black communities and the subsequent collapse, uh, that wealth gap uh, ballooned up to 20-fold from 10 to 20. Now, it's typical in our culture um, for different <coughs> experts to not talk to each other. And the fact that we have, among other things, doctors and lawyers in the same room here is already progress, I think. Um, but when we try to do research on health, uh, we don't have access, whoops, we don't have access necessarily to income information. But we tried to overcome this problem in Illinois by creating something called a transgenerational birth file. We took a cohort of births from the state of Illinois, got the mother's name, exact, her maiden name and date of birth, um, went back and got her birth certificate from years earlier, and linked those two. And then since they both had a uh, census tract of residence coded, we could then link it to neighborhood income. So for each one of these births in our cohort, we would know what kind of neighborhood the baby's parents lived in and what kind of neighborhood the mother lived in when she was born. So this gives us sort of the life course perspective um, and allows us to make some very interesting observations. If we just look at income difference from one point in time, it's already dramatic. We see deciles of income. Um, those clustered toward the higher incomes are white mothers in our cohort. Those towards the lower deciles are African American women. Um, but there's a large area of overlap. But when we introduce the second dimension, now let me walk you through these uh, pictures a little bit. So we have white women on the left and African American women on the right. And for both groups, these bars are situated on a four by four matrix. Their birth income, that is where their parents lived when they were babies, uh, is shown from left to right, and from front to back, the adult income. So along this row, white women, approximately 39%, were born into the most affluent uh, neighborhoods as babies, and then they ended up in different places as adults. African American women, over half, were born in the poorest neighborhoods, and again, some of them ended up in not the lowest uh, income areas as adults. But when we do look at these things, the lifelong comparison becomes quite dramatic. Those who've been exposed to uh, high income for their whole lives, 25 times more likely for a white woman. An African American woman, 29% versus 0.2% uh, always in the lowest income quartile or 145 times the risk of lifetime exposure to poverty. What does this do to health? We looked at low birth weight in two different ways. One of them is the relative risk of low birth weight. Uh, and the other one is, if you add up that risk across the whole population, how much of the low birth weight is explained. For relative risk, both groups have a significant increase, although it's actually steeper for the white women. That is to say, white women always living in poverty has twice the risk of low birth weight. For an African-American woman, it's one and a half times what it would be for a more affluent individual. But when you look at it for the entire population, this only adds up to explaining 1.6% of low birth weight among white moms and explains almost a quarter of the low birth weight in the African-American population. So what about women whose economic status changes? <coughs> we looked uh, at African-American women whose lot improved in life and we saw 29, 11, and 4% moving up to quartiles 2, 3, and all the way up to quartile 4. And what we find is that there's a stepwise decrease in the low birth weight rate and a 30% reduction in mortality in the first year. So it helps to do better. <laughs> well, it also goes the other way, um, an important fact at this time of financial collapse. Um, white women uh, who were born in the most affluent uh, quartile but then deteriorated, 41, 31, 3% fell all the way down to quartile one. And they had an increase in the risk of preterm birth and 2.7 times the risk <coughs> of their baby dying in the first year of life. So what we know is that 
History and politics definitely shape inequity. That race and class are closely intertwined, but whatever your race, your class still impacts your health. Whatever your class, your race still impacts your health. And changing class can change your health outcome. Bottom line, we could do a lot better. Kawachi and his group at Harvard made a very interesting observation in a paper they wrote in 2005. They said that one of the main functions of racism in the United States has been to divide people so that they are less able to struggle politically in their common interest. And I think this explains a lot of why we have the particular kinds of politics we have in this country. It's the only country that doesn't have a labor party or some kind of a, you know, pro-socialist type party. And it's also, despite all the terrible racial things that have happened in Europe, this is a unique country. It's the only country that was founded on the extermination of one ethnic group and the enslavement of another. So this is a different kind of place. The good news is that <laughs> white and African American families uh, have, in fact, common interests. They want jobs, health care, home ownership. Um, and this provides the objective basis for political unity. It's the subjective thing we have to work on. But that's what it would mean to pull the 99% together. And this has happened as recently as last year in the Chicago's teacher strike, where uh, teachers, students, and parents of all races came out to fight together. So the way forward, I think, is alluding back to Dr. Smith's comments earlier and Dr. Berry's comments, a multiracial grassroots political movement is what we're going to need. Um, and actually, I'm not going to be cowed by the term class warfare. I'm just going to go on the counterattack. Um, being a good policy wonk is just not enough. Thank you. Thank you. Another great panel. And we have time for a couple of questions, and then we are going to get together in our second breakout session of taking, building upon what you did in the first session, taking these discussions about what is race. I find that so interesting. That was my class yesterday to my bioethics uh, class. What is race as we define it? But taking it in the social context and looking at the interpersonal cognitive bias, the institutional, and getting back to this issue about how the structure of our healthcare system is not effective for anyone, but particularly for those who are disenfranchised. So uh, two questions. We have time, and then we're going to break up to our groups. Um, hold on one second. Uh, Mike, down here. And can you say who you are, Louise? <laughs> <laughs> Kenny, um, Professor Emerita here at the law school um, and have run the health law clinic for, for many years before I retired. Um, I had a question of Dr. David, and that was whether you identified any segments of the United States population that actually had the um, infant mortality rate of the number one country in the world. separated out the most affluent and educated, you know, women, and they'd probably all, you know, mostly be white, you, know, you would find, you would find that something that was similar. And, and, and another part of that is in, what, what was it, Hong Kong? Uh, the, uh, no. That was Victor Hill in Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Do they have uh, universal health care? Yes. Uh, I, well, I'm not sure. Um, parts of China do not. Hong Kong in 2000, I think, uh, was mostly covered, but I'm not sure about that. Um, most of the countries that have been in the top five, if you go back over several years, uh, that's certainly the case. Sweden, the other Scandinavian countries, Japan, uh, um, And if I may just take a little bit of time to talk about uh, Dr. David's other work, um, is this 
It's that it's just not about the health care. And we haven't gone about uh, into it as much, but it's also the stress that you have on you, right? That oftentimes we focus on diseases and say you should eat better, right? That you should do these things. But stress is linked to obesity, it's linked to cancer, it's linked to infant mortality, it's linked to um, heart problems. And so that is also an issue um, and that uh, Dr. David and his colleagues have written about. Since I see no other hands, I am going to take, oh, there's one, okay. You got it right in there. After this, we are going to, so prepare yourselves. You already have the forms, you're getting back into the groups that you were into, and we will talk over the break, and then we will come back and uh, start our final panel for the day. Professor Not so Frank. much as a question as a comment. Uh, Dr. Davis, I really appreciate all your work and your presentation, uh, which really dealt with the race class thing. I just, I, I, my antennas go up whenever I hear it's not just minorities. And I, your presentation at all didn't go this way, but I've got a comment on it. Because my own experience is when we try to wave when we try to work on things as a common group problem, on the idea that everybody will get help, minorities and uh, blacks, um, uh, blacks in particular, end up not reaping the benefit of that group work as much as other groups do. And I just kind of, you know, we, so I, I, I guess I just want to lay that out that we can't just improve the health of everyone that won't get rid of the gap. Um, okay, thank you. All right, with that. Okay. Well, here's. I think we have to focus on the other gap because I think. Uh, I think first of all, you know, white um, working class people whose babies are dying at a higher rate than the the very best performing groups, I should research that so I can make that, that contrast clearer. But uh, to make it clear to, that, to those individuals that, hey, you know, the reason that you need to try to improve black infant mortality rate is because we also need to improve, improve white infant mortality rate. And it, the kind of political unity, uh, just like when the teachers go on strike together, it's not just to improve the uh, working conditions of the African-American teachers, but it's mindful of the fact that they were being disproportionately hurt by the cuts that uh, Rahm Emanuel is trying to do, and that the students in our system are mostly uh, black and Latino. So there was this, an explicit anti-racist component and an explicit multiracial unity program. I think that's really the only way forward. Uh, I, I would hope so. <laughs> My experience is, Nine times out of ten, that way forward leaves black at the end of the road. I'm going to interrupt that and say, keep hope alive. Move <laughs> in to your breakout groups. Now, in your breakout groups, what you are supposed to do is to take that one disparity, right? I know we did something different, but when we get to groups, take one disparity and talk about how you think racial bias is actually causing the disparity. Are physicians not talking to the patients? Are the institutions not set up in a way to actually treat them? Are the services they're provided not quality services because of the communities that they are in? Okay? And so let's come back together in about 20, 25 minutes. Thank you.